right, good afternoon. Let's get started. I'm Michelle Le Wong. I'm a professor of geography and geographic information science here. Welcome to our campus geospatial data science distinguished lecture this afternoon. Thanks for joining us for Friday afternoon, 4 to 5 p.m. Um, this uh, lecture series is uh, supported by our Office of the Provost and co-sponsored by a number of campus units reflecting the cross-cutting nature of geospatial data science. And uh, this is also a live stream. The link to the live stream is uh, go.illinois.edu slash geodatascience. And feel free to tweet that and share that link with, uh, uh, with your social media colleagues. And also welcome our online participants and attendees. We have a sign-up sheet, I think, somewhere you might be passing around. Thank you for doing that if you're interested, especially in the future lectures in this series. Now, with my uh, great honor and the pleasure, I'd like to introduce you uh, today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Professor Stuart Frobenham from uh, Arizona State University, where he's a uh, foundation professor of computational spatial science and uh, also university regents professor there. He's also the director of the Spatial Analysis Research Center, Spark Center there. And Stuart is a really uh, internationally renowned scholar in GI spatial analysis and the quantitative geography. So he needs no introduction for those of us who are working in those domains. But uh, for the diversity of the audience in the room as well as all my participants, I'm going to give a short introduction in the interest of time. Stuart got all his higher education out of geography. He received his PhD uh, at McMaster University from uh, Canada, and uh, he started his academic career at Indiana University, and since then he's moved around and uh, really left his footprints across the globe, impacting a variety of uh, related fields. He um, is uh, widely, for instance, respected as uh, the doctor and Mr. GWR, Geography Weighted Regression. And of course, his contributions are really broad. Uh, including uh, many topics. Uh, he's received numerous awards, accolades, uh, for instance, as a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, what impressed me most is uh, he's always asking interesting questions. He's uh, such a powerful thinker. And that included my experience when I was presenting a talk at one of those early GI science conferences. He was sitting in the front row and it got me nervous. Uh, but recently we had dinner chat last night. He asked me, a few questions. Uh, I'll mention a few examples here. So one of the questions was, Xiaowen, uh, what's the geographical distribution of people in China prefer to eat noodle versus rice? <laughs> <laughs> and how geography matters in the formation of this, uh, this distribution. And uh, another question is completely different. Uh, how geography matters in people's perception and also making fun moments across different culture. Uh, so a question like this really makes you think hard. Uh, but the good news is that he indicated that he'll have answers to some of those questions. I give you as examples in today's talk he's uh, going to give to us. Uh, I cannot wait to hear his answers. Uh, but first of all, let's give him a round of applause to welcome him here. Thanks. Great. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to, to be here. It's a, a delight. I was at uh, Illinois, um, University of Illinois uh, in my first uh, job at Indiana University in, uh, between 1980 and 1984. That's how old I am. And uh, I came across here to, uh, to see a few people. But that was the last time I was here. So I haven't been back since. Uh, how many years is that? Quite a lot. 30 odd years. Uh, so it's a delight to, uh, to be back here. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about the geography of processes. And I've, I've, I've not presented this before anyway. This is the first time I've done it. Uh, as a consequence of that, uh, I do have, uh, I got overly excited, and I've pr probably got far too many slides. Uh, so I'm going to have to run through some of them fairly quickly. But let me, and so I know, I know that everybody's going to leave at 5 o'clock. This is a really bad time of the, of the week, I would have thought, 4 to 5 on a Friday. Um, but I'll try and do my best. Right. So to set the scene, uh, the goal of research, what we all do, right, is typically we try to uncover something new about why things are the way they are. That's the kind of overriding kind of goal of, of research, basically. And we're often prompted to ask this question, 
by observing data about things, whatever those things might be in our own areas, and noticing that the data vary over time or over space or both. And what we really want to know is, well, how did these observations arise? Uh, or what are the processes which have generated these data? Or more basically, why are the values sometimes high and sometimes low? That's what prompts us to think about things. So if we see maps like this, and there are millions of maps one could uh, use as representatives here, uh, and we look at, uh, this is uh, stroke deaths rates um, between 2000 and 2006, and we look at this across the United States by county, and we're immediately drawn to this map because we see immediately that it's not a random process that has produced this map. Right? There's, there's clearly a set of processes here which has a geographic bearing. There's something about the southeast, the diet, etc., the lifestyle, which uh, leads to a, a, a quite a significant raised incidence of stroke-related deaths. And if we look at, for example, how a uh, very topical thing at the moment, how Britain uh, voted in the uh, referendum to leave the European Union, Again, uh, the blue areas here are areas where the majority of people voted to remain within the European Union. The red areas are areas where the majority of people voted to leave. And again, that's not a random process. We can see that immediately. There's, there's some geography behind this. There's, there are, there's some set of geographic determinants in here which have led to this map. And what we want to know is what are those? What are the, what are the things? Why are some areas uh, the people are definitely voting to remain? Why some areas uh, ha have, are inhabited by people who want to, to leave? And then finally, one I'll return to throughout this talk is, again, something that's very relevant to us still today, is what happened in the 2016 uh, presidential election. So here's the, the uh, distribution of counties um, in terms of their voting for the Democratic uh, Party in the 2016 election, the ones which are in blue, where the majority of people voted for Hillary Clinton, the Democratic nominee, and the ones in red are the counties where the majority of population voted for Donald Trump, the Republican uh, nominee. And again, that's not a random pattern, right, of blues and reds. Uh, there is clearly some set of non-random processes which have produced this result, and we're going to look at that in a bit more detail uh, throughout the next 50 minutes. So these are distributions of spatial data, and I've emphasized that word data, right? They represent the visible. These are the things we can see, that we, we can measure, and we can map them. And to try to understand why things are the way they are, the visible bit, right? We often construct a model of the processes we think produce the data we observe about the environment. And these processes are the invisible. We can't see the processes. We just see the output from them. So it's like looking at vegetation cover and trying to infer the geology below it. You can't see the geology. We can't actually you know, penetrate the ground and, and look at it. But from the air, we can't see the geology, but we can see the result at the top. So basically what we have are spatial data, which we can observe, observe. We know that there are associations which are linked to those data, the thing that the object that we're interested in, voting for the presidential, in, in, in the presidential election. And we can measure these things. What, what associates with these, this vote for the, in the 2016 election? And what we do then is it try to infer the invisible part, the, the spatial processes, which we cannot see. But we know that these spatial processes have produced the data that we can see. So that's the visible component that we, we work with. What we really want to get at is the invisible bit. And the most common way of trying to get at the invisible bit is to calibrate a spatial model and obtain estimates of the model's parameters. That gives us some indication of what might be the processes that have produced the data we're looking at. And the more parameters we can reliably estimate, then the more information on spatial associations we can generate to help us make inferences about spatial processes. Right? Now let's return to the map on how the counties voted in the 2016 presidential election. This is the uh, proportion of democratic votes by county in a straight fight between Democrats and Republicans. So I've taken the, the, the third party votes uh, out. Okay. And as I say, it, it, so the um, red areas are where the majority of people voted Republican. The blue counties are where the majority voted for the Democratic Party. What's caused that? What, what are some of the factors that might associate with that, with influencing people's voting behavior? Well, from the literature, using common sense, and, and checking for various statistical artifacts, 
We've come up with 12 explanatory variables which are thought to influence the decision to vote for the Democratic Party. Gender ratio, uh, younger age, age voters, people between 18 and 29, elderly voters, uh, 65 plus, um, percentage African American, percentage Hispanic, median income is often touted as a, a determinant of, of an influencer of how people vote, education, uh, income diversity within a county, so I measure this by Gini, Gini coefficient, looking at in, how much diversity in income there are within a county. Uh, percentage employment in manufacturing. Manufacturing is always touted again as some kind of influencer on voting patterns. Typically, the perceived wisdom is that the higher the proportion of people in manufacturing, the more likely we are to vote for the Democratic Party. Come back to that. Uh, population density, which separates the rural areas from the cities. and uh, the uh, third party vote, okay? So this is here as an um, influencer in the covariates because what we want to know is does, if you voted for a third party, does it actually detract more from the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? And then finally turnout, again, as, as an influencer perhaps of the, uh, the outcome of the vote. So if turnout's high, does it favour the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, etc., right? So these are uh, 12 explanatory variables which seem to ha cover most of what people talk about in, in the literature in terms of determining voting in the uh, presidential election. All 13 of the variables, the 12 covariates and the dependent variable, are standardized. Uh, there's no significant multicollinearity in this uh, data set and there's no obvious heteroscedasticity in the uh, global results. So what does the national picture indicate? Okay. Well, it looks like this. The R squared is 0.64, and we've basically got, and the uh, significance levels are, are quite strict. Uh, one star is the 5% level, two stars is the 1% level, and three stars, alpha is 0 0.001. So what do we have at the national level? Okay, well, we've got two variables which don't seem to have any much explanatory power, uh, gender ratio and uh, the elderly voters proportion. We've got two covariates which have a neg negative influence on the democratic vote, which are the younger age group, which is surprising, and uh, median income. So as your income goes up, that's expected. As your income goes up, you're less likely to vote for the democratic party. And then all the rest, and because the variables are all standardized, we can compare these, uh, these parameter estimates as a, as a measure of strength. Uh, all the rest have a positive association with the democratic party. So. Uh, African-American percentage, Hispanic percentage, education, very strong indicator. The Gini coefficient, percentage of manufacturing, um, population density, people in cities are more likely to vote for the Democratic Party than rural areas. Uh, the third party vote, interesting. So the more votes are cast for a third party, the, the better it helps the Democratic Party, apparently. And uh, turnout, as turnout increases, the Democrats gain from that. But these data that have been used to calibrate this model are in places, okay? They don't occur in a vacuum and they relate to different locations. And it seems reasonable to think that the processes which have generated the vote for the Democratic Party might vary across the country. Why should everybody, why should that vote for every county be determined by exactly the same kind of uh, influencing covariates? Perhaps some of different strengths in different parts of the country. So that's, that's a global model I showed you, which is typical of the kind of way of our thinking. It simply describes the averages of what might be, and I say might, might be spatially varying processes. And the way to think about this is, suppose I came in here and uh, Xiao Wen had kindly invited me to give a, a talk on the climate of the United States, okay? And I said, okay, uh, the average rainfall across the United States per, per year is um, uh, 25.6 inches. And uh, the average uh, daily temperature uh, is um, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And then left the room, okay? You'd think I was mad, okay? I've just given you two averages which are sort of virtually meaningless. What you would want me to talk about is a pattern behind those averages. You'd want to see variations in temperature across the United States. You'd want to see variations in rainfall across the United States. You know that some areas are dry, some are wet. Okay, so in, if I came in and talked to you about data and just gave you averages, you wouldn't be very happy. So why are you sitting there, why, why are you happy when I give you 
data which are averages of processes, which is what I've just done in that global model. Those parameter estimates are averages of what might be, we don't know, what might be interesting spatial variations in the way those covariates influence, in this case, voting behavior. And if there are spatially varying processes taking place, those averages are actually meaningless. Because it's like just it's the average temperature in the United States, or the average rainfall. That's the kind of information level you're getting from those uh, results. Now, the first indicator that there's something horribly wrong with those results I've just given you is if you map the uh, residuals from that global model, and you'll see here they're massively uh, spatially dependent. <laughs> Certainly not independent, right? So the inference from that global model goes out the window, and we clearly have some sort of problem. Now, let's turn to another way of looking at this topic, uh, and that is uh, geographic weighted regression. And I'm not going to go through lots of slides on this. There's a few, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that people can either read about it or know about it already. But in a typical linear regression model, it doesn't have to be linear, it can be nonlinear, applied to spatial data, what we are doing without thinking about it is assuming that the processes we're investigating are stationary. Because that's what the model is going to give you. It's, going to, it's based on the, the principle that everywhere is the same. These processes are the same. <coughs> so the model of, this is a representative of many kind of models one could put up, but it's global in that for every relationship in this model, we're getting a single, we'll get a single estimate of, the, uh, of these relationships. So we'll get a single estimate of beta one, a single estimate of beta two, et cetera, in this, in this model. We take all our Y measures, all our measures on X1, X2, X, X, X3 in our study region, whatever that might be, mix them all together and come up with single estimates of these parameters. But what if those parameters, those influences, the, the influence of the covariance is varying over space? Just as the climate does, just as, as, as the rainfall figures do, just as the degree degrees do across the, the United States. Well, let's allow that possibility and let's allow the parameters in the model to vary spatially. So what we'd like is a model where we can actually calibrate the model separately for each location. And that's the essence of, of geographic weighted regression. But the question you should all be asking yourself is, well, how can you do that when we typically only have one measurement of Y, one measurement of X1, one measurement of X2 at each location? So the answer is actually very simple. So the problem restated is that if we believe the processes we're examining might be spatially non-stationary, and we had many repeated samples at each location, then we could just run separate regressions for each location. Problem solved. Right? But unfortunately, we rarely have that luxury of having repeated samples at each location. So the solution is to just borrow data from nearby locations. And we weight those data according to the proximity of the location to the, those locations from where the data are being borrowed. And under the assumption that there's some kind of spatial dependency in the processes that we're looking at, in order to minimize bias, we want to just borrow data from nearby locations. We don't really want, we don't want to influence and unduly bias our local estimates by taking data from a long way away. So we come up with some kind of spatial weighting function where there's, there's a regression point, there's our, our location where we want to uh, estimate a local uh, regression model. And we just weight the data nearby. So if the data, data here will be given a weight of one, this point here, this location is quite close. It will be given a weight close to one. The weights, the weights go from zero to one. And data which are, lie a long way from the regression point will be downweighted. They'll get a weight close to zero. And basically, we just apply that very simple principle to our study area. So suppose we uh, want to produce a local regression uh, here at this red dot. We just measure the distance to the nearby locations where there are data, and then put some spatial kernel, a weighting function over that, center it over that, and then weight the data accordingly. And of course, we can do this in an infinite number of locations. We don't even have to have data at that location. Right? So we could do it for any point we want to in this study region. And when we do that, every time we move this kernel and center it on another location, we weight all the data differently, and we produce a set of local parameter estimates at each location. And that's, the, that's basically geographic weighted regression in, in a nutshell. 
Now, one of the things in it, a key component of this, is that we have to select the appropriate bandwidth, which is the distance decay curve in this spatial weighting function. And this optimal bandwidth is a trade-off between bias and variance. If you choose too small a bandwidth, you'll get a large variance, a large uncertainty in the local estimates. Because you, you, you're basing your local calibration, your regression, on relatively few data points. But if you choose too large a bandwidth, then you get increased bias in the resulting parameter estimates. So in the software, we take some goodness of fit criteria, and there's a selection in the software one can select from, one can choose. Uh, usually I use a corrected um, Akaiki information criterion. And we try lots of different values and come up with an optimal value of the, of the bandwidth. So now, when we do all this, we put all this together, we have a model form that allows us to examine basically any possible spatial process heterogeneity or e sometimes referred to as spatial process non-stationarity, if it exists. Now, what we mean by this is that spatial context, or this thing called place, that our, our cultural geographers' uh, colleagues uh, um, work on a lot, is that, that context, the spatial context, might have an effect somewhere, in this case, on how we vote, which is not measured by any of the covariates in our model. So in theory, what we have is there's some outcome up there. In this case, I'm looking at voting behavior. And that's a product of a whole set of exogenous effects, the things I'm trying to capture in my model, the covariates. But it might also be a result of something intangible and possibly unmeasurable about place. That, and that's context here. So we mean in a modeling, con modeling situation, we mean by context, does where you live affect what you do? And we use this word context as a sort of shorthand to basically describe the impact of a person's location in space on how they behave in that space. And in some cases, there might be identifiable and measurable aspects of context, which we should then incorporate into our model as part of the covariates. I'm not counting context in that regard. I'm, I'm counting it as the bit that we can't measure, but we still think might influence uh, our behavior. So what, what, are, what is this thing? What can it be? Well, there's a whole series of things it possibly could be. It could be that where you, so it's, how does where you live possibly affect how you think, how you behave? Well, Possibly it's because of things like this, traditions, customs, lifestyles, and daily practices which are common to an area, and that affect social norms, which in turn affect individual behavior. Ecological influences are the features of the physical environment that might affect people's thoughts and feelings, etc. Other economic conditions, which we, again we can't measure, but it might be there, like persistent unemployment. Uh, can we... Uh, can are there economic conditions like that which can affect people's outlook on life and ultimately their behavior the influence of families and family and friends and social media has kind of exaggerated this so do, do we imitate the people around us or the people we talk to on social media and then local media and, and geographically targeted social media um, and the Brexit and the US presidential election uh, campaigns are both prime examples where people were geographically targeted through social media. If you've seen the Benedict Cumberbatch um, film on Brexit, it, it's, it's extremely good at that, uh, telling you about that. So it's basically selective news representation. There's the same national news out there, but local uh, stations can report it in quite different ways. You just have to look at Fox News and, and CNN, the way things are, are reported. Uh, and then, of course, selective migration reinforces these trends. So we have opinions about if you if you're count yourself as a very liberal person, you might think, well, I'm not, I don't really want to live in Alabama. Okay? If you're uh, very strongly right-wing, you might say, well, I don't want to live in uh, Washington State or Oregon. Okay? Uh, so the selective migration reinforces these kind of cultural uh, effects. And there's lots of there are a lot of papers out there that support this notion that there's something intangible about place that affects our behavior. So here's a, a paper from um, uh, Brahan and uh, Aguiar. On page two, it's, on, uh, it's in plus one. 
2017, uh, voters embedded in social networks of friends, family, members, neighbours and co-workers influence each other in terms of voter turnout and support for particular candidates. It's exactly what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in this terms of uh, these election data that I have. A uh, paper for, by Renfro et al, 2013, in, in a psychology journal, there's overwhelming evidence for regional variations across the United States on a range of key political, economic, social and health indicators. However, a substantial body of research suggests that, that activities in each of these domains are typically influenced by psychological variables, raising the possibility that psychological forces might be me mediating or causal factors responsible for regional variation in key indicators. And then another one down here. Uh, the most common explanations for the American political divide point to religion, racial diversity, education or wealth. The present findings suggest another explanation for the differences stemming from the psychological characteristics of residents. They claim that there are, in terms of psychological profiles, there are major differences across the United States. Another paper by Renfro et al. in, in PLUS One 2015. Recent investigations indicate that personality traits are unevenly distributed geographically. These are associated with a range of important political, economic, social and health outcomes. And then there are strong links between the locations in which people live and their attitudes, motivations and well-being, constructs that are central to psychology. And yet psychological scientists have only recently recognised the relevance of geography for understanding such important and widely studied phenomena. But there's a problem, um, and it's exemplified by a few uh, people already. And, uh, John O'Loughlin's uh, coverage of 35 years of, of the journal Political Geography, uh, he says, but if context has remained a mantra in political geography, how do we measure its importance? <coughs> in the Brahan uh, Aguirre article, a pertinent question here is how to disentangle the effect of social contagion from that of exposure to external influences. The identification problem goes beyond voting. People hold opinions on a multitude of topics that inform alternative courses of action from crime participation and smoking to riots and protests and financial markets. And finally, uh, in the, the book by uh, Ryan Enos, which is all about context, the role of context, um, a lot of it in Chicago, um, nobody doubts that context can affect behavior. And careful studies of neighborhood effects have strongly suggested it can. However, the exact nature of contextual effects, how much they really matter, is elusive to researchers. Okay. So, how can we achieve what has seemingly been impossible for decades and try and measure the role of context in influencing our behaviour? In essence, how can we show that geography actually matters? And the answer to, to this is to turn to local models such as um, geographic weighted regression and the one I'm going to use is the more recent version, multi-scale GWR, and that's described in the paper in uh, 2017 in the Annals. So, multi-scale geographic weighted regression allows the parameters in our model to vary over space. So U, I, V, I are coordinates of a location. So the parameters are going to vary over space, but they also, this bandwidth uh, here, is going to vary across the covariates. So we're able to get a measure of scale for each of the processes independently in our model. So this bandwidth tells us a dis it's this distance decay effect. It tells us how local or how regional or how global the processes are. And with multi-scale GWR, we, we get a measure of this from the calibration. So not only do we get uh, location-specific parameter estimates, which is going to be interesting to look at, it's the data behind the average, but also we get a measure of the bandwidth for each process, which tells us something about the scale, the geographic scale at which that process or those processes take, uh, taking place. So you can download the software for free. Uh, it's not something we've written overnight. It's a product of about 20 years of work. So it's fairly robust. Um, it actually uh, is uh, incredibly flexible in that we've run it with uh, over a million data points, which is quite incredible. Uh, but you can download it all uh, for either Windows or Mac uh, there. Okay. So let's go back to this, this thing here. There's the observed proportion of democratic votes by county. And here's the model prediction from MGWR. Okay. So we do a very good uh, job of, of modeling this, uh, this uh, data set. And there's the residual map I showed you from OLS, the R squared 0.64. Uh, massive dependency in that. Uh, there's the, data, the residual map from MGWR. There, there is no uh, significant uh, dependency in these residuals. 
and the R squared is about 0.9, is around 0.92. But most of these residuals are in this uh, region here, it covers zero. So they're, they're quite small. The, the scales on those two maps are the same. You can see there are lots of bright blues, bright reds, etc. in that. And there, there aren't so many. There's one or two outlying counties, but most of them are kind of close to zero. Now, not only do we do that, so we've solved that problem, but we've also now got covariate specific bandwidths for each of our sets of parameter estimates. And there are 2,800 uh, counties in this data set. So basically, this thing here, these numbers here, indicate increasingly, if you go up here, increasingly local processes. Basically, it's saying up here, we're only using 43 of the nearest neighbors. These are the number of nearest neighbors, number of locations we are taking to uh, compute our local regression. So to um, obtain the local parameters for the percentage of African Americans within each county, we're only taking 43 of the nearest neighbors and, comp and computing our local regression on that basis. Right. And those, those data are weighted between zero and one. We're not giving them all a weight of one. Whereas a process like this, the effective income on how people vote is, is pretty much global. It's the same everywhere. That, that weighting function is pretty much, it's almost flat. So everywhere is getting a weight close to one. So the results are pretty much the same all over the United States. So I can now show you a geography of processes. I can show you these, the, the processes now behind those averages. Okay, So instead of looking at the average rainfall, we can look at the picture behind that and see where the values are high and where they're low. So I showed you the average rainfall equivalents, which were the global parameter estimates. I can now show you the maps of the local processes behind those averages. So here's, and I'm going to do it in, in um, ascending order of the bandwidth. So I'm going to start from the more global and go to the local. So here's the parameter surfaces for um, income. And it's a, pretty much a global process. The global value, the global parameter estimate from the OLS model is minus, two, minus 0.205. It was highly significant. And it's, it's significant everywhere. So anywhere it's not significant, I've masked it out. But here it's significant everywhere. So, and it has pretty much the same effect. The, pr the local parameter estimates don't vary very much at all, from minus 0.24 to minus 0.19. So it's basically, in what it's saying is that income is pretty much a global, has a global impact on the way people vote across the United States. The higher your income, the more, the less likely you are to vote for the Democratic Party. Uh, similarly with the, uh, the, log the third party vote, again, that's pretty much global. And it's, the effect is, again, pretty much the same everywhere. It's significantly uh, negative. Um, a uh, significant, uh, sorry, positive impact on the democratic vote everywhere. Then we start to see a little bit more spatial variation in the results. The bandwidth is now 8.53, so we're seeing some regional trend here. This is the impact of gender. And basically, there isn't an impact of gender in most of the South. There's no, there's no significant impact there. The impact of gender, and, and basically it's the more males there are, the, the more likely you are to vote for the Republican Party. That's true, most of all of New England, the upper Midwest, and, and most of the West. The impact of age on the elderly on voting. Again, it's insignificant on all the East and Midwest. It's only significant out in the West. And again, the, the bandwidth is 637. We can see the geographic scale of the process. It's very regional. And but what we're saying here is that the, the impact of the elderly on voting is actually just a Western phenomenon. There's nothing at all, and there's nothing, no evidence to, to support that in the Midwest or the East. And basically here, the parameters are significantly um, uh, negative. So it has, a, it has a negative impact on the voting for the Democratic Party. In, the, in these counties, the elderly are slightly more likely to vote for the Republican Party. Manufacturing, a uh, similar kind of pattern, but here you see we pick up Florida, and it, it picks up Florida, pretty much at the, the state boundary. I haven't put the state boundary in here, but apart from, you know, it's got a little bit of the panhandle in, uh, but pretty much uh, all of Florida's in there, but, and it's separated from the rest of the South. So basically the impact of manufacturing is, is significantly uh, negative, uh, and this is interesting, in most of the Western counties, and significantly negative in Florida. Now, admittedly, there might not be too much manufacturing in these places, but we're in a big manufacturing belt, there's no, uh, no discernible impact about employment and manufacturing on, on how people voted in the 2016 election. Now, this is interesting. The global parameter is significantly positive. It's actually highly significantly positive. It's at the 
0.001 level, it's significant. But the local parameters where they are significant are negative. It's a great example of Simpson's paradox with spatial data. Because what's happening at the national picture is this. The counties with high proportions of employment in manufacturing are also the counties that tend to vote for the Democratic Party. And we've got a, a distribution of points that looks like that. And a, 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 at the global scale, there appears to be a positive association. But when we separate these points into local areas, we can actually get significant negative um, results. And that's a, that's a well-known uh, artifact. There's some fantastic examples if you go on the web about Simpsons Paradox, particularly with baseball uh, uh, hit, hitting uh, rates, um, batting averages. Uh, and this, that's what's happening here. Locally, when you look at it, there is no impact of manufacturing, apart from in the West where it's negative and in Florida. But in the rest of the country, it's not, it doesn't have any significant impact. Then uh, population density, the influence of city living versus rural living on whether you vote Democrat or Republican. That does have an influence. Again, but not down the eastern seaboard and, or in the southeast of the country. It does have an influence in the rest of the country. So uh, anywhere out here, living in cities, you're more likely to vote for the Democratic Party. Everything else being equal, of course, in our model. Uh, income disparity, an interesting one. So where there's greater income disparity in the western counties, it's significantly uh, positive, you're more likely to vote for the Democratic Party. So presumably seeing... Uh, people more disadvantaged than you is having an impact on, on voting for the Democratic Party. But it's the opposite completely in this corner of the Southeast. So Florida and Georgia, Alabama, there, there's a significant uh, positive, uh, sorry, significant negative uh, local estimates. So here, where there's greater income disparity, you're more likely to vote for the Democratic, uh, the Republican Party. Hispanic vote. Uh, so it's pretty much significant neg negative, uh, sorry, positive everywhere across the country. Counties with higher proportions of Hispanic population tend to vote uh, Democrat. Uh, but there are areas where it's not significant, and these are areas with, with fairly low Hispanic populations anyway, upper Midwest and in the central area of the country. Uh, and then um, education. So again, education has pretty much a uniform effect. It's stronger in some parts of the country than others. So if you've got a bachelor's degree, you're more likely to vote for the Democratic Party, quite strongly, out, picked out west um, and in the northeast. Uh, there are patches where it's not uh, an important influencer, and that's Mississippi down there. All right. uh, age, the, the younger voters. So people always, if you look at the media, people always say, oh yeah, the younger voters um, tend to vote Democrat. But that's not uh, true. Most of the country, there is no significant impact of, of younger age group. Remember, we're holding everything else constant, so we take out education from this, etc. Um, but in the West, there is a significant impact, and basically it's a negative one on the, de on the democratic vote. So younger voters in the West tend to vote Republican. There's a, there's a higher rate of voting Republican in the, in the West. The only place in the country where there's a significant um, positive impact on the democratic vote is in around Columbus, Ohio. Right? Nowhere else. Then turnout. So this will be of interest to the political parties, I would have thought. So it's saying that when the, when the turnout increases in a, in, a, in a county, does it influence the way the vote goes? Well, most of the country it doesn't. But again, we pick up Florida really nicely across there. So when the vote, the turnout increases in Florida, it, it favours the Democratic Party. So the Democrats should be getting, uh, making all their effort uh, to get people out to vote in, in Florida. It doesn't matter, really, in the rest of the country. There's a few pockets, but Florida's the place they should be looking at. The Republicans should be trying to influence uh, voter turnout in these, country, in these uh, states down the, the Great Plains, and including down into Arizona, which is an, another swing state now. So in Arizona and Utah, then it would favor the Republican Party to get uh, a, bigger a bigger turnout in the voting patterns. Uh, influence of uh, African Americans, the local influence. So we're seeing, uh, again, this is a whole new geography now. You're not seeing data, you're seeing processes. So here, the influence is very much uh, significantly um, positive in terms of the demo influencing the democratic vote, as, as one would imagine. It's a very strong indicator. Uh, but there are three, four patches in the country where it's not a significant, uh, doesn't have a significant impact on votes. And these are areas where there's a relatively low proportion of African Americans. So Washington, um, Arizona, Colorado, 
Minnesota, Wisconsin, and then New England. Yeah. But the rest of the, oh, oh, and southern Texas, so, so it's mainly um, very uh, Hispanic uh, counties down there. Then the intercept, which is arguably the, the most interesting of these uh, maps, because this is showing you the intrinsic nature or the influence of space, the intrinsic nature of voting, whether you vote for the Democrat or, or the Republican Party, independent of all the covariates we have got in our model. We're taking those out and we're saying, OK, we've accounted for all these different things, people's ethnicity, their age, their income, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a still an influence of geography and of location. And yeah, there is. And, and it actually matches exactly what we would think of. We can actually quantify this now. So even accounting for mixes, different mixes of socioeconomic um, factors, basically all these counties in the south, and particularly in, in Texas here and New Mexico, there's a strong, significant tendency to vote for the Republican Party, even account above and beyond what we would think of accounting for people's income, etc., and their, their ethnicity and whatever. But again, not, not central and southern Florida. It picks up northern Florida, and I used to work in Gainesville, uh, and I can attest to this, that northern Florida is really like the deep south, uh, whereas central and southern Florida isn't. Uh, so you're picking this up. Then we're picking up on the opposite side the areas which are intrinsically Democrat. So we've got New England, the eastern seaboard, the upper Midwest, and um, particularly areas like Wisconsin, Minnesota, and then on the, the far northwest. Okay? And then in between, these are all the areas where people are kind of on the fence. They're not, location isn't an influence, ha having a significant influence on their vote. Now, the ability to do all of this through local modeling, and particularly to estimate the local intercept, opens the way t to separating the uh, otherwise unquantifiable contextual effects from the socioeconomic effects. So here's the, my model. So this is all of the, these are all my covariates. They're all in standardized form, right? They're all, they all have a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. There are the local parameter estimates on these uh, socioeconomic conditions. There's my local intercept, and there's my dependent variable, again, standardized. So if I take away the stand, well, if, if I make this explicit, the standardization, so there's y, y star, it's just y minus the mean divided by its standard deviation. And I do the same thing for the covariates here. Right? And then just do a bit of rearranging. Then I get a model where this, where here is the percentage of people who voted for the Democratic Party. And it's actually comprised of three components. There's a mean baseline vote for each county. So it's the average across the, the US. Then there's an increment due to geography, geographical context. And then there's an increment due to the population composition, the people in that space. So this is, this is place. This is the impact of location. And this is the space bit, the container, the people in it, the people in that location. And we can, we can separate these three effects. We can actually measure them. So there's the baseline vote. Okay, it's the same everywhere, and say 50%. There's the predicted influence on the Democratic vote. It's this bit of the equation. Okay, I can actually quantify all that. So this is how counties would vote were it not for geography. So all these southern counties, given the makeup of people, the composition, people should be voting for the Democratic Party. Right? And a lot of the Midwest should be voting for the Republican Party. Okay? If the people did not, if, if geography geographical context wasn't important. And we can then, and these, these are actually the percentage votes attributed, what you subtract or add to that mean 50%. These, this is the contribution due to geography, due to location, where you live, the people you talk to, whatever those local influences are. We can actually measure them now. So in some areas in the deep south, we are talking about subtracting 10 to 20 percent from the, the, the democratic vote for each county because of where you are, geog geographical context. In some of these areas, the deep blue areas, we're adding 10 to 14 percent onto that vote, again, onto the democratic vote because of where you live. And when you put those three maps together, the baseline, the bit due to socioeconomic composition and the bit due to geography, then you get the predicted map, which again looks just like the actual map. Uh, it's very, very close. 
And then finally, we can consider uh, two scenarios. First is, uh, what would happen if every county had the same mix of population? How would we vote? Okay. And the second one is, what would happen if geographical context didn't exist? And how important is it in terms of influencing the vote for the, the 2016 presidential election? Well, scenario one, what would happen if every county had the same mix of population? Well, we can easily look at that from our, from our model down here because we just get rid of that bit. Okay? What we're saying is there is no, everywhere's got the same mix of population. How would people vote? How would these counties vote? And that's how uh, the votes would have gone if every county in the United States had exactly the same mix of population. We can actually measure that. So again, the reds are, are counties where the majority would vote for the Republican Party and the blues are counties where the majority would vote for the Democratic Party. And it's a fairly close call. Uh, if, you, if you work this up to the Electoral College and states, etc., um, I don't know which way it would go. Okay? It's fairly close. What would happen if geographical context didn't influence voting? Right? Well, we just get rid of that bit right? and then predict Y from this model. Right? And that's how uh, we would have voted without geographical context. So if geography wasn't important, this is the way the counties would have voted. And there's no doubt under this scenario that the, the Democrats would win the election. They've got the, the main cities on the eastern seaboard. They've got Florida. Um, they've probably got Texas um, and, and California. Okay? So they'd probably win the election quite handily. So that's how we actually voted. Right? And that's what we've got um, as a consequence. So. If anybody asks you if geography matters, right, it does, okay, really matters. Uh, and apart from then uh, determining US international relations, domestic policy, and the fate of the world for the next four to eight years, uh, are there any other implications of these findings? Well, yeah, there are, because this talks to transferability of results. Because whatever its meaning, if context does affect spatial behavior, then this has strong implications for the transferability of results from one location to another, okay, the R and R debate. We shouldn't expect the results of a model, the same model calibrated in one location to be the same as the results of the, same, of the model calibrated in another location, if context has a role to play. It also has implications for the modifiable area unit problem. Because here, the problem is that the conclusions drawn from any type of spatial analysis of aggregated data depend upon, to some extent, the definition of the spatial units to which the data are aggregated. Well, if there were no spatial heterogeneity of processes, then I don't think there would be a modifiable area unit problem. Because different aggregations of spatial units mixes the different processes. And therefore, you'd get different results. If the processes were all the same, then different kinds of mixing would just give you the same results. Scale. We now have the means, through things like MGWR, multi-scale ge geographic weighted regression, to actually measure the spatial scale over which different processes operate via that bandwidth measure. Geographers have long talked about scale. If you do a literature search about scale, you'll see it pop up everywhere, right? But nobody measures it. We all, we all recognize that scale has different, there are different scales of effects on something. So if you measure um, uh, urban climate, urban temperatures, then you recognize that there's an urban heat island effect, which is fairly local, but you also know that there are regional trends and global trends in, in, in climate, which are affecting the measurements that you're making. So there are different scales of processes operating, but we've never been able to measure that. And now we do have a way of, of, of measuring it through the bandwidth. And then there's the whole big debate within geography about uh, the nomothetic versus ideographic approach, the, 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 the idea of space versus place. And the distinction has long been made that, that, and the claim is that the quantitative geographers just view space as a container. Uh, it's just where something happens, basically. Uh, whereas um, cultural geographers will look at it as, as, as place, where there is something important about location which affects our, our behavior. And these two views have been completely separate and until now. And I think that local models such as uh, MGWR give us a middle ground. They give us somewhere in the middle because it recognizes the role of context explicitly, but also it's modeling it and it actually we can measure it quantifi quantifiably. 
And then finally, it's basically a new geography. Because all those maps I have showed you are not a geography of data. They're a geography of uh, processes, right? And, and, and they make you ask questions that you would not have asked otherwise. So all those maps I, I, I ran through quite quickly, there are things in there which you should say, well, why is it like that? Well, what's happening? It's the same with looking at maps of data, and you say, why are values high there and, and low here? Uh, that make you ask interesting questions. And, and come up with solutions and answers to that. Well, this is a whole new geography. We're asking a whole different set of questions. So that's the uh, end of my presentation, and I think I'm just in time. Uh, 15 minutes I was given. So uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question mm. about your three components you decompose mm. into the mean and the one component yeah. uh, related to the geographic location mm. and the other one uh, uh, about the uh, covariates. Mm. So the sigma y here, how did you how did you calculate to the sigma y? What what the sigma y in your uh, middle the second component? Oh, the, the sigma y. It's the standard deviation of the y values, the, the observed values. So observe the values uh, occur for each county. Yes, the county, the county vote for the. It's a percentage of people who voted for the Democratic Party in a straight fight between Democrats and Republicans. So how does, how does that represent the uh, location, the geographical location effect? That that in itself doesn't. It's the uh, local intercept that does it. So that that component has has a local intercept in it. Oh, has a local yeah, intercept. Yeah, yeah. So it's a local intercept that sucks up all of the locational effect. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Is mm -hmm. I hear for the social sciences, like um, for um, often, like the landscape um, kind of uh, um, determines how much uh, how much dependence or how how far the dependence among the data decays. Like yeah. if there is a mountain river, okay. even right. the yeah. two components. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes, okay. So, so uh, in this uh, modeling exercise and in the software, mm -hmm. uh, it calculates uh, the weighting based upon a Euclidean distance to the, to the, locate, to the data points. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it does that because all you have to do is input the coordinates and the uh, software computes the weighting matrix. You could conceptually uh, put in your own weighting matrix if you wanted to. It would just be extremely cumbersome and time consuming. And, but you could do that. And you could therefore put in, if there are hard boundaries, such as a river or a mountain range, and you don't want those, th those weights to cross those boundaries, you could put that in yourself. But that would be a customized application, because clearly that would only be uh, effective for a particular application. So in the software, the generic way of computing the weights matrix is based upon Euclidean distance to location. Now, and, and, and it's not only convenience we do that. It actually makes sense for, for most kind of processes because uh, you could say, well, why don't you put in road distances? Well, processes don't travel by road, right? I, I don't know. You know nobody knows how, they, how diffusion of this kind of things works. So road distances might be useful. And I've actually published a paper using road distances where you've got for example, in London, we had house price data, and the River Thames runs right through the middle of the city, and, and it does influence the housing market either side of the river. And so there, we, we used road distances for it because it made more sense. But in lots of other things, like here, I'm not sure that road distances would make any sense at all. And in fact, it doesn't have a major impact on the results because we've tried it. If you, you used, for example, uh, some um, Manhattan-type distance metrics here versus a Euclidean one, um, so, yeah, we, we can customize it in the way you said, and I think that it makes sense in some cases that there might be a mountain chain or a river or something in which stops the diffusion of whatever these processes are. And we could actually put that in. So conceptually, that's quite straightforward to do. Operationally, it's just a bit of a mess because you'd have to, the users would have to input their own weighting matrix. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's really a joke. Uh, I have a question, but I, I want to go 
provide some background to my question. Yeah. So I'm a hydrologist. Okay. Uh, right. Working in the, in the geography department. Uh, and almost everything that you mentioned here actually applies to hydrology as well. Really? I, I, I'm, I'm surprised at that because I would have thought you've got physical laws, etc. That, that... Yeah, exactly, that's exactly what I'm coming to. <laughs> yeah, so right. everything that you said applies to us. For example, you, you, what we do is we actually see something on the surface. And yep. the explanation for that actually is under, underground. So yep. we need to build a model to... Right, to, okay. So yeah. everything that you said, including yeah. Yeah. Uh, the scale that you mentioned, the scale aspect you mentioned, right. we actually have something called representative element area, which is the area uh, that around which we average our and so on, which is yeah. what you have. So given all that, I my question is about, the, you mentioned about the, the word process. Yeah. So yeah. because process for hydrologists is actually right. a dynamic thing. Right. It, it, it's water moving around, water interacting. Okay, and, and right, so okay, on. right, okay. So mm -hmm. that, yeah. Right. So what is your definition of a process? Because okay. I have thought that yeah. voting, right. the number that of waters, okay. number of water, water that you, right. you count, is actually part of the process. Somebody decided to vote. Somebody making the, okay. the, the action of voting, yeah. Yeah. That, that action is governed by or under, underpinned by other processes that people communicate with each other or, you know. Well, that's it. That the, those so are, those are, you just are, use the question, word. What is the yeah. process? Yeah, you just use the word in the context I'm using it. It's those hidden things that, that affect whether the outcome of somebody's action, that, that affect me you are voting not, or... You are not actually modeling the process. Yeah. Well, no, we're measuring associations, which we're inferring, the processes we're trying to infer from the associations that we, we're measuring. But the processes I mean are those things which you were talking about, the things which affect somebody's behavior. We don't know what they are. We're trying to get a handle, an indicator of what they might be. But we don't know the exact mechanism by which I, 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 your, your ethnicity, how does it, your ethnicity affect your voting behavior? I mean, you know, it's some decision-making process that you're, you're undertaking, but I, I've no idea what that is. And we're not, get, we're not drilling down to that level. So we're at the level of associations and saying, there are, there are these things here, and for shorthand, I'm calling them processes that affect our behavior somehow. But, it, but they're, they're unbelievably complex. If you think hydrology is complex, it, look at human beings, right? Uh, try and model their behavior. It's, it's pretty much impossible. Right? At least you've got laws that govern how things work, right? What, well, I think water flows downhill all the time. I know that much. So, but but, but you, you, there's no such law for people, basically. And that's, that's the problem. So we, we're typically not, unfortunately, we're not at the level of being able to formulate exact relationships or determining factors. We're, we're in, stuck in the, the, the stage where we have to infer everything. That was a great talk. Oops. Yeah, you put the microphone on for that, that statement. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> right, say, it, say it more loudly. <laughs> that was a really great talk, and um, I have to say I love your method. I like it much better than GWR. <laughs> I always complain about because... <laughs> and because it's so descriptive, you just get a, a map showing all sorts of points. something mm. and in, yeah. in the health geography area mm. what people are doing now is more longitudinal mm -hmm. analyses yeah. so, so yeah. at least yeah. I mean you can't get at cause and effect mm -hmm. necessarily but yeah. you can mm -hmm. see if something changes in response mm -hmm. to a yeah. change in like advertising or mm -hmm. um, a turnout campaign so I, I was just wondering how you might push mm. this. I, mm. I know it's hugely complex already. Uh. Could you push it even further to, to uh. look at those yeah. kinds of yeah. uh, the, the, the way one could get, 
and it's not a perfect way by any means, the, the way that one could examine something of the dynamics of this process is just to go back and repeat this exercise for each of the presidential elections like every four years. And what would be fascinating to, to see, and I, and I really want to do this, is, is if, this, if this geographical effect is actually hardening over time. And, and that, is, is, it, is it dynamic? Is it changing? Right? And are we getting more polarised spatially and, and in terms of uh, political uh, ideology uh, over time? And that would be fascinating to see. And all of the other results I showed are just a snapshot in time, and it would be interesting to see if they've changed over time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. other, other questions? Oh, Siva, you want to follow up? <laughs> so, uh, following up on the same, same line, so this is a heavily database model that we are using. Yeah. If, if let's say that we have an election next in, um, well, let's say Australia. I mean, I, come, I want to go far, far away from here. Yeah. Um, and uh, they want to ask you. Can you apply your model in, in a place with less data? Yeah, yeah. Can this work? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's going to be difficult. So if you've got a place like Australia where basically nobody lives in the middle and everybody's living around on, on the periphery, uh, the, uh, y y it, it could still work if there are enough uh, data points around the periphery. So, so if the bandwidths are in the order of, let's say, 100 nearest neighbours, and, and I don't know what the voting constituencies look like in Australia, and I don't know how big they are around the coast, but where you have a significant number of people, then you may be able to get some results. But it's not going to be transferable right across the country because there's no data, basically. I mean, or, you know, the, the areas are, are, are huge. So it, doesn't, it won't work as well. You won't get that nice continuous uh, view of space that you can get with in, in other areas. So, yeah, it's a technique that works better when the data are plentiful, that's for sure. And, and you do need quite a lot of data as well because you, you're... You're computing local regressions uh, around each point, and not only are you doing that for the optimal bandwidth, but you're also doing that for lots of other bandwidths, which may be a lot smaller than your optimal. So the whole search procedure for doing that means it's going to there's going to be a lot of trial and error, and, and, and some of those bandwidths are going to be very small, and, and, and the results might just uh, you know blow up basically if you've got very few data points in an area. The the, the mitigating factor on that is that. I'm not going into the details on this, but the bandwidths we're using are adaptive spatially. So they're based on a number of nearest neighbours. They're not fixed. So if, if, the, uh, if the optimal bandwidth is, say, 100, it means that the, that, that waiting thing is going to go out to the 100th nearest neighbour, no matter how far away that is in, in space. So it's going to capture it. It just means that if it's a long way away, the weight is going to be close to zero. And it means that if most of the points are a long way away, most of the points will have a weight close to zero, and therefore you get very high standard errors. But all that means is basically those parameter estimates aren't, we're not going to be looking at them because they've got huge standard errors on them, your uncertainty bounds. But it is, it, it is a technique uh, that is data hungry, there's no doubt about it. You, know, you can't run this with just 100 data points, it, it, it would be meaningless. So, a related question. Yeah. So bandwidth, there's a variability and selection issue there. Could you say a little bit more about uncertainty quantification in general in your framework? Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so there, are, there are two bits of uncertainty, two types of uncertainty, well, several types of uncertainty, but one is in the, the, the local parameter estimate, so we have to adjust for, we're doing multiple hypothesis tests here, lots of them, and we have to adjust for that. Uh, but we're also doing dependent uh, multiple hypothesis tests, so we have to make adjustments to the typical adjustments. And we can actually measure the degree of dependency in our parameter estimates from uh, something called the uh, equivalent number of parameters that comes out of the, the software, which is just the trace of the hat matrix. I'm talking to one person in a room, I think. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we compute that, and that gives us our, 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 our measure of uh, adjusting for the multiple hypothesis testing, which you have to do in terms of looking at the significance of the local estimates. But there's also uncertainty in terms of the bandwidth estimation. And again, we've just got a paper, we just published a, uh, uh, sorry, just submitted a paper uh, looking at uh, bandwidth uncertainty as well. And we can measure that and report that as well. So e each of those uh, bandwidth uh, measures come with an interval uh, of uncertainty as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe yeah. time for one more question. I don't see any question from yeah. this side. <laughs> <laughs>
for a special balance. Especially yeah. varying. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Oh, again asking. <laughs> Uh, Everybody else put their head down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my question is, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that 13 variables that you use in the model. And uh, my question here is, how can, uh, if we as a researcher uh. do not know any like uh, prior information about the model, then how can we know that which variables that we need to start or like okay. applying oh. GWR or MGWR. Yeah. So, yeah. Or, yeah. or does the MGWR inform researcher, researchers to select yeah. those yeah. variables to look at? Right. So, so what 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 you have uh, uh, queried there is a very uh, common question, and and this this technique isn't designed to answer variable selection. But uh, so that's a common problem, and what what I always say is that variable selection. You should make sure that the global model you have is as good as it possibly can be, right? Before you do any kind of local modeling, because otherwise, uh, if you've got a poorly specified lo uh, global model, then the, the the local model is just going to wrap itself around the local intercept. You're going to get overfitting. So you must start off with it with a, uh, as good a global model as you possibly can get. So you need to spend a lot of time, just as we ordinarily do, in trying to come up with the best global model. And in our area, typically, that's difficult because there usually isn't any theory to inform us as to what those variables should be. And it, and it becomes almost an empirical matter as to you know, which variables work and which don't. Uh, w and so you have to go through that whole routine of, of, of uh, model, model of variable selection uh, before you run the GWR, basically, or MGWR. So, so it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vitally important point that you raise, and, I, and I, I can't stress it enough, and I do it to my students all the time, to say you must work on that global model. This isn't an excuse for not thinking about your model, right? Which some people have used it as, right? And, and just, you know, come up with a magically high R squared and all it's done is just wrap itself around the local intercept. So, it, yeah, it is vitally important that you actually consider your model very carefully be before you do this. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. In the interest of time, let's yeah. wrap up. Thanks so much uh, for your participation. But let's give uh, Stuart another round of applause okay. for uh, the fantastic lecture. We have a small token of oh, appreciation. Wow. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, thank yeah. you. Wow, that's, that's and beautiful. It has a globe wow. on it. it does indeed. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, I really like that. That's, that's brilliant. It's nice between global and local. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's got Illinois on. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. That's really nice of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So this uh, concludes this lecture, and we'll continue. The next lecture will be early November. You will get announcements, and in fact, we have two lectures in November, including one on our GIS day. So stay tuned. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.